Hey folks, you're on the Insecurity Project. I'm back with Greg and Greg's written a book, but you can't say it like that because it's the mirror image. So I'll tell you what it's called, The Hidden Faces of Change, The Less Obvious Truth About Change. This is a long time coming. Yeah, it's, it's maybe 20 years. Incredible, I'm so excited to have it in my hot little hands. You've written something very nice to me in it, which is kind, thank you. It's all right. Uh, can you tell us about why you wrote this book? Yeah, so I was, uh, I came out of my corporate life about two, uh, almost getting, in August it'll be two years ago. So I'd had 23 years in ministry, I've had a decade or so in corporate, and I was just, I was burnt out, I was tired, it had been, it had been a hard journey. Uh, Ange and I had been married for 30 years, so we, we headed off over to the, um, overseas, to Europe, hmm. and while I was in Greece. It sounds all very exotic. It was. Um, while I was in Greece, I had this inspiration. I was in Athens Airport, actually. And I felt like uh, all the work I'd been doing in change had been focused on change as a process. And I was sitting in Athens Airport just going, ah, it's more than a process. Hmm. I, think there's, I think it's a whole lot of other things. And I immediately wrote down five things that I thought change was. Uh, or five ways or in, as I say in the book, I think it has five faces, not just one face. And so when I wrote that down, I felt like, oh, there's a book here. Mm. And then I took a year off and wrote a book. I remember you telling me that you're writing a book and I had a very physical experience of that conversation, which I, that happens occasionally for me when someone's sharing something and it's like every cell in your body is impacted by that. It was mm. just like, there's something very beautiful and wonderful about this news. Um, this is a real gift because it's coming out of the essence of who you are and what you, what you bring. Yeah. So, um, yeah, very exciting that it's actually out now. Uh, so, so um, yeah, tell, tell us, we're talking about the inevitability of change beforehand and that often we resist it. Mm. So can you, can you paint the picture about, uh, how change actually works and how we think it works. Yeah, so I think for me, um, if we if we lead off, I worked in the change management, change leadership space for a you know, better part of half a decade, um, specifically in that space. Um, and then prior to that in helping teams change and you know, it, it, I ran my own consultancy and, and mm. so change was a very big part of what I did and I specialised in that in the back end of that. Um, and there was always this conversation that, that uh, well, number one, change was always narrowed down primarily to being a process. Yep. Uh, and I think there is, you know, which is your current state, future state, transition state. There's no doubt that there are certain changes that fit into that category. Mm. I argue in the book that that's a really artificial version of um, change. It's, that is actually a mental construct that we make up because most of us don't live in the past or the future we live mm. in the present so we have to kind of do a bit of mental gymnastics to to understand change as a process so for me change wasn't just a process it was a bunch of, it, i thought it was a bunch of other things mm. but primarily the thing that i really didn't like in my professional life was this idea that we're in control of change okay the the, the standard kind of refrain from change management, even though change managers do, there are many good change managers out there who get a lot of great stuff done. There's lots of training. It's a very crowded space talking about change, but so many people's experience of it, especially in corporate, was that it over promises and under delivers. Yep. Right. Um, and for me, that was, um, I was just going, well, why is it always like that? Why, why are we trying to, so why do we say that we can help people through change or I'm going to train you to lead change and people still come out with a negative. Mm. So for me, there was kind of this inherent dynamic in change where change continued to be this elusive thing that, that beguiled our best efforts. And what, and so the conclusion that I came to is that, um, is that we don't lead, manage or control change. In fact, it's the opposite of that. Change leads, manages, and controls us. Okay. Uh, and for really good purposes, for really good reasons. Um, 
So, so what does that mean? Can you unpack that? You mentioned um, before we went to record this about, you know, the universe is, is moving from simplicity to complexity. Yeah. Um, can you unpack that? Yeah. So I think if you look at, if you look at your life, and I, I talk about this in the book, if you look at your life and you look at, say, you know, you could have on one side, you know, you could have pain, misery, loss, and then you could have on the other side, you know, love, gain, success, right? Or whatever, whatever binary things you want to have, mm. right? The funny thing about love, the funny thing about life is that the people who I get the most amount of love from, get the most amount of joy from, have the most amount of success with, you know, my wife, my family, my, my dear friends, they're also simultaneously the people that can hurt me the most. Mm -hmm. And so there's this dynamic in life. Where, like I use the example in the book of like, if, if my neighbor who I like gets a terminal illness, I'm, I'm sad. You know, it's a bad thing. If my wife gets a terminal illness, I'm shattered. Mm -hmm. I'm undone. And it's this, it's this kind of dynamic where life just seems to put uh, opposite things together and make them all the one thing. And what that does is it, it just deeply makes everything more complicated. It makes everything more uh, confusing, makes everything more overwhelming. So life has this habit of, of if we started in simplicity here, our evolutionary arc isn't to stay in simplicity life has got you know summarily more complex mm -hmm. if we start you know if you're an evolutionist and you go we started as an amoeba mm. well i'm not an amoeba now yeah and i'm having much more comp you know my conversations are much more complicated than the tadpole in the pond you know i think you know not mm. that i understand tadpole but you know the, the arc of the universe is into complexity and the challenge with that dynamic that we're moved, we're always moving from the known, the secure, the certain to the unknown, unsecure, you know, is that we, we don't choose that, mm. that, you know, we resist complexity. We resist uncertainty. We resist mm. insecurity. We don't like the depths. And in the book, I use the analogy of change being like, you know, change is like a mighty ocean and we, we feel like we could drown in it. It could be, it could, it could uh, subsume us and we'd be lost in it. Um, did you say subsume? Yeah, I think I can't remember what did I say. It would subsume us. Is that like, is that different from consume? Don't change the point. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, swallow us up, you know, like, like you know, just overwhelm us. And, and because we wouldn't choose that, it just dawned on me that um, there has to be an agent that takes us into that complexity and that agent would actually operate against my will and that agent would be mm. more powerful than me and that agent would i wouldn't be able to manage that agent it would manage me i wouldn't be in control it would be in control and for me i go oh my gosh that's a really that's that agent in our life taking us into complexity depth substance that agent is change. Yeah, well, and, and your point is that agent is not malevolent. It's not trying to ruin us. No, that agent is just pushing us. That agent is like the ocean. The ocean's not malevolent. It's just, it's, but it is an ocean. Yeah. It, you know, uh, you need to stay afloat in it. Mm. So there's some skills, which we address in the book about staying afloat in the different mm. tidal currents of this ocean called change. But that, that even that, that kind of central idea is a movement away from the idea that, that we can any more than we could control, manage, lead the ocean. The ocean yeah. We can't control, manage and lead change. Mm. We can have a red hot crack, but it mm. will always prove to be, mm. uh, it, it will be bigger than us. Um, you, you talk about failure in the book about the importance of failure and the role failure plays to kind of break us down and kind of show the futility of resisting change and well I, I i think that if you one of the things that i think as we confront change is that um the the times when we're genuinely sober the times when we genuinely ask great questions the times when we're humble enough the times when our ego has had the air let out of it sufficiently as to not be getting in the way is is when we've experienced failure and so mm. i think that 
uh, our failures don't conspire against us. Our failures become incredible. Uh, they instruct us. They, they, they cause us, again, they cause us to need to go deeper mm. because obviously we've been found out or we're inadequate. Or, mm. But the inadequacy is not something to feel guilty and embarrassed about. I mean, you, you, you take ownership of it. But the inadequacy is a wonderful kind of way of saying we got to move on. We, we need something better. Mm. And so the person who is either fearful of failure or can't stand being wrong or has to be the smartest person in the room or has to be the expert, that's just tiring. You know, yeah. I'd, I'd rather meet the person that's failed a lot mm. uh, because inevitably they'll ask great questions. If they're not totally defeated and destroyed by it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Know, Which uh, is an option. It's an option. Uh, then they'll ask great questions. Mm. They'll, they'll be realistic. You know, they'll be thought through and, 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 and full mm. in that regard. So I, I say failure is a constant and necessary companion in negotiating change. Mm. Um, you know, one of my stated intentions with the insecurity project is to uh help end unnecessary suffering yep. uh, and i think there's there's so much of what you're talking about is an unnecessary suffering if you're fighting against the ocean and putting all your energy into that yeah. you will suffer greatly and and needlessly um and the, if change is is going to move us from simplicity to complexity and lead us into depth and and greater experience of meaning um, there's a letting go. There's a yeah. There's this massive dynamic of surrender. Mm. You know um, what I do in the book is I go through and I talk about that ocean kind of has five faces, and the five faces I identify are inevitabilities. For example, if your partner got a terminal illness, mm. you know, or 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 less dramatically, you might find yourself in a business culture or in any kind of environment, and it's just absolutely not who you are. Mm. And you know that inevitably I need to get out of this, and and staying there is not an option. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, um, so so inevitability is a face of change. Um, inevitably, events. I mean, COVID nineteen is an event, mm. massive change. Um, uh, and unfortunately, I printed the book before the advent of COVID nineteen, so uh, I didn't get to reflect on that in the book. But you know, there's there's any number of events which usher in change. Um, Change is a process, as we've talked about. Change is an invitation. You get invited to do different things. That facilitates a lot of change. Mm. Um, and then change is a revelation. So with all of those five faces of change, they all have a personal formation challenge. Right. You know, they all, they all are going to demand something different from us. Um, and so the book tries to address uh, how the ocean change with its five different faces uh, will present you with five specific challenges. Um, and, and, and part of staying afloat is, is figuring out what the season demands. Mm. Um, a great example might be if you take the inevitability, well, if you take COVID-19, for example, more specifically as a change event, the, the nature of events is that they sweep away the known, the normal. Mm. So there was a normal, there was a normal state of things prior to COVID-19, COVID-19 happens as an event and then the normal state doesn't exist anymore. No. Uh, now, what that, what, now, the personal formation challenge of having no, 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 no normal anymore is you move into a betwixt and between state, which, which they call a liminal phase, which is a, you know, it's the passing through the doorway. Mm. Um, and, and liminality is a place of tension where you don't have answers. You know, you have lots of questions and not many answers. You have lots of demands and not much capacity to meet those demands. You have a loss of uh, the resources that you had before and not the resources that are going to get you across the line. So liminal tension presents us with uh, a huge amount of kind of personal formation challenges um, that, that we need to address. Yeah, sure. Um, so who would not enjoy this book? Um, I, I love the, the thinking about, you know, business, the niching piece, because immediately when you, when you got an idea and you put it out, you think everyone could use it and everyone would benefit from it. 
turned out that's not true. No. Um, so who would find this book a pain? Well, I mean, I, I, the person who wants to, you know, the person who wants to rip through it and find points on how to be a winner okay. in change right. um, is not going to enjoy it. The person who doesn't want to, the, the person who just wants a quick, easy read, it's not a quick, easy read, mm. unsurprisingly. It's got know, some big I, words. I don't do quick, easy reads. No. So, um, no, it's a book that you just take your time with. The first three chapters are relatively de- dense as it mm. sort of sets up mm. some of those primary ideas. Uh, but yeah, if you're, if you're in for, and I'm very revealing, so it's very personal. Mm. Uh, there's a fair bit of my story in there. Mm. Um, so if you don't want to know about me and you want to rush through it and you want a book that gives you five points on being a winner, <laughs> don't buy this book. <laughs> Uh, but if you want some genuine substance on the conversation about change. Hmm. It's such a, a unique and valuable contribution to the space. Uh, you know, I, like you see uh, the change management all the time, especially in the corporate world and just how ineffective it is. Just so many conversations that very rarely lead to anything fruitful or life giving. Yeah. I think, I think that's why, Admitting that we don't control it, but learning to flow with it is a really nice, mm. is, an, is a different take on that, on that same conversation, as is broadening the scope, you know, and sort of saying change just doesn't come in one size. Mm. Yeah. Um, I, also think, I also think one thing that one of the reasons why I think that change management as a discipline is slightly impotent is because it tries to map everything that is different and calls everything that is different change. Right. So, you know, last night I, you know, last night I bought a meal at the Chinese restaurant this night, you know, we, we ate at home. That's different. No, it's not. We still ate dinner. Mm. Uh, That's, that's not a change. It's, it's different, but it's not a change. Um, If we went without a meal, well, that would be a change, Mm. (laughs) you know, but we, but it's, it's just different. I, I, you know, you drove from your place to my place this particular route, but on the way home you drove uh, another way home. Well, that's a big change. No, it's not. Yeah. It's, you still drove home. Yeah. It's just different. And there was, that, there was that classic comment by Heraclitus who says that, you know, the only constant is change. And, and that's a comment that makes change so all-encompassing as to make it a nonsense. Mm. If every single thing that is even vaguely different from one another is change, then change means nothing at all. Mm. Um, And there's this dynamic within change management where we're mapping differences. And I think, you know, humans are really good at transactional differences. Like we, we are an enormously adept species at managing transactional difference. So change can't just be managing and controlling transactions that might, that may differ change has to be something significantly of a higher order mm. than that. So um, in the book, I point out a few areas where I differ from the, the where I think that we could have some, the change management space, change leadership space could have an expanded kind of mm. conversation and where we might want to preclude certain things like mapping differences, which, which a lot of people who, work in business and they're putting in a new IT system and they map all the things that are going to be different and they think that mapping the difference is going to help people. And people just go, it doesn't help at all. Hmm. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so when you, when you sat down to write it and the process of writing it and, and bringing your heart and soul to this project, um, what are your hopes for the readers, those who are ready for this and who will find value in this? You know, you know, what's the what's the gift in this for them? Do you think? Yeah, I think I wrote. Uh, there was a time like when we wrote this. Like I said, we were in Greece, and we went to um, one of the places that we went to in Greece was a place called Meteora, which is which is um, it's just Greece is actually quite flat, and then you drive kind of you know for five hours up into n- northern Greece, and then these hills just pop up, and then these kind of mountains. They're just they're like volcanic tubes and they just rise up for hundreds of feet you know five six hundred feet up in the air and on top of these pillars they built these monasteries and and um and they're funny because the monasteries didn't start as monasteries when the when the ottomans came up and were were 
taking over the the the, mona- the the religious people fled into these mountains and they some of them were hermits and then a couple of hermits got together and lived together and then eventually over hundreds of years you get these sort of stable monasteries and you can't attack them you can't you know these are just like pillars that shoot up in the sky and then there's a monastery on top and, mm. um, and it's ama- they're amazing and we were we we spent a, two days walking through these places and the, the feeling in these places where you go to a place that for you know, the better part of 600 years has just been immersed in contemplation, reflection, substantive dialogue. You know, you're walking around a place. It feels sacred. It feels, um, it feels powerful because the whole space is just dedicated to preserving things of real substance Mm. um and while i was there i just thought Angie and i you know we we're religious but we're not so religious that we light candles but there was an opportunity to go to this little this little chapel and and i lit a candle and when i lit the candle i just i just prayed a prayer of i just want to be on about substance Mm. you know i just want you know i want i don't want people to get froth and bubble i want people to just when they look into something to just run into real substance, something they can go, yes, that has weight. That is worth, mm. that, that's worth bothering about. Mm. And, and Angela, when she lit her prayer, she, she prayed for direction. Um, and so in Meteora, before I'd even written the book, I knew that I wanted the gift to come out of it would be that people would, would experience something of substance and it would subsequently give them real, real direction. Mm. So substance and direction. Wow. Mm. Uh, wonderful. Well, if that sounds like something you're looking for, where can, where can people find this book? Yeah, so uh, at the moment, just on my website, so mm. uh, www.gregbellingham.com. And uh, it's, you, it'll come up and just follow the prompts and mm. uh, it's under book and you can buy it from there. Great. Mm. Well, thank you for bringing your gift to the world and um, I'm super excited to read this and I'm sure lots of people will benefit greatly from it. Thanks, mate. Nice work. We'll leave it there.